Hello, welcome to this video, and on this video I'm going to be ranking from 10 to 1 the greatest living jazz musicians. Why am I doing this? I tell you why. Because I recently did the 10 greatest jazz musicians of all time. Now if we were doing this for rock pop or pop music, um, we would probably find that a lot of those artists would still be alive. In terms of the jazz list I did, I looked at the end of it and, and they were all dead. And uh, I actually found that quite upsetting that they were all dead. And then I start to think, well, who would the greatest living jazz musicians be? And this is quite, um, it, 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 it's quite humbling to know there are certain artists around still. They're still there now and they connect us with the great history of jazz. And I wanted to talk about that. But also I wanted to put the spotlight on a number of different artists. In, in other words, this one would be more difficult. The jazz one was easy. I think it took me about probably 10 minutes to come up with the list because it was just so easy to go through that. And there was changes I could. I didn't get Dizzy Gillespie on there. I didn't get Art Tatum on there. I think that was two that deserved to be in there. But the trouble is, who would have I got rid of? You know, you're, you're arguing to get rid of probably Coleman Hawkins. People wanted me to swap Coleman Hawkins for Lester Young. I think that's probably accurate. Um, as I've said over and over again, these lists, I'm going to sneeze in a minute, sorry. If I sneeze, it's going to be left in. Now, you know I don't edit my videos. I've never had a sneezing fit on a YouTube video. But it's turned cold here in the UK. And I've got the uh, November sniffles. Anyway, um, we'll keep going. We'll keep marching on. Um, so I thought this list would be a, um, a much more interesting list. I think the last list I did was, uh, was pretty objective, actually. A lot of people felt that. This one is not so objective. This is much more based upon my personal experience of listening to jazz. So I apologise for that before we go on, but it, it isn't my favourite ones. I didn't do that. If I did my favourite ones, that would be a different list again. It's very interesting to ask yourself these questions because you get a greater understanding of what art and music is by doing this. And actually, this informs you as a person. I think this is a very positive thing to do. So I will start at number 10. And at number 10, I have a drummer. A lot of people complained I didn't have a drummer on the last list. And I think Max Roach and Kenny Clark should have been on there. Elvin Jones could have well been on there. Philly Joe Jones could have been on there. Art Blakey could have been on there. There's a whole post of incredible drums. You know, Baby Dodds should have been on there. You know, Joe Jones. My God, Joe Jones from the Camp Basie band. You know, Gene Krupa. You know, the, these drummers are really important. But I haven't got any of those because they're all dead. But the guy that is alive, incredibly, coming up to pretty close to his 100th birthday, I think this guy is, is, is 98 years old, is the incredible Roy Haynes. That's who I have at number 10. Roy Haynes has been involved in jazz making at the highest level since the 1940s. I don't think there's anybody that we from say 1940s onwards that he hasn't played with, including playing with Charlie Parker and John Coltrane. Now, does that get you on the list? No. What gets you on the list is your innovation, your creativity, your, your, your influence. Um, for me growing up, Roy Haynes um, personified a certain way of playing jazz drums. Um, and because Roy Haynes was so pioneering for so long, you're able to hear him move from being an incredible bebop drummer into the freedom of the 60s jazz and then into the fusion era. Now, the album that really influenced me by Roy Haynes was the trio music album um, by um, uh, Chick Corea, which is a trio of, <laughs> is it Miroslav Vitos, Roy Haynes and Chick Corea? where they do a mixture of Thelonious Monk tunes and also free improvisation. And his drum sound and approach and the melodicism of his playing ups really, really influenced me, the way he tuned the drum kit. Um, he, is, he has worked at the top of this genre right up until now, and he's still out playing. I'm watching videos of him in his 90s where he is still one of the greatest jazz drummers to have ever lived. Um, here in the UK, there is a certain way of playing jazz drums, which I have found actually quite, um, it, it hems you in. There's a certain approach and sound to jazz drums, which um, I have railed against. And I have always said to these people that I absolutely love Roy Haynes, right? But that 
influence is so big, ubiquitous and this doesn't get said. You do not hear drummers so much sounding like Elvin Jones. Jack DeJohnette's become more of an influence as time's gone on. But the style, if you take someone like Bill Stewart, I really feel that style is rooted in the, the playing of Roy Haynes. So this is a mighty, a mighty um, person in the history of jazz for me. And someone that is still around that can connect us back almost 80 years to an era when the Giants walked the world. <laughs> right, so that's who I have at number 10 is Roy Haynes. Right, so when I put this list together, I thought I really want to put a sort of relatively modern musician. It's very difficult to put a musician that's just emerged in the last four or five years on a list of the greatest of all time. But I did want to put a modern musician on. I know I focus so... Um, so much on the past on this channel. So I sat down and thought, right, I'm gonna pick one musician that is really around now, you know, that we could point to and say, that is a great musician, you know, who, who, who would that be, you know? Um, I have gone over and over this in my mind. And I, yeah, to be honest, there, there, there is only one that keeps cropping up. And this musician is an absolute virtuoso. They are able to pull from every aspect of jazz you know, they don't get hemmed in on playing acoustic jazz or fusion or electric jazz. They take all that stuff and they're able to put that together in a way that seems to be respected by everybody all over the world. This person plays to huge audiences and they've had a huge influence. Um, and this person, um, when I discovered them, I went down a rabbit hole of just... I was astonished by their performance. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm milking this, you know. So who is the the one jazz musician around today that I am going to put on the list of the 10 greatest living jazz musicians. And it is the great Hiromi. I absolutely love Hiromi. An absolute virtuoso, um, somewhere between Herbie Hancock and uh, Oscar Peterson in, in style, but able to pull in absolutely all sorts of influences never falling into the traps of sort of jazz conservatism and never falling into the traps of Muzaki, Fuzaki, Fusion. Um, when you hear her in perform and watch her perform, it is not the virtuosity that strikes me, which is so often the case with very many great jazz musicians emerging at the moment. She seems to be connected. The great musicians are connected. I was chatting to one of my patrons the other day and they said in 1975 or 76, they'd seen Bill Evans play. And I said, what was it like? And he said, it was like a spiritual experience because they were connected. You know, Bill Evans would sit down and connect to whatever the great thing is out there, the great reservoir of infinite wonder that you connect to when you play music. And some musicians are directly connected to that. Coltrane seemed to be like that. Alan Holdsworth, for me, seemed to be like that. Hiromi seems like that to me. When you watch her play, she seems to be completely within the music. Um, a friend of mine met Hiromi and interviewed her for a magazine. And she said that she felt that when she played that her great mentor, Oscar Peterson, was at her shoulder. Right? Um, this idea of channeling greatness is something that I have not spoken about on this channel and I may well have to talk about it because it is on the shoulders of giants which we all stand and Hiromi seems to be able to access that, able to access what went before so incredibly. Um, she never seems to be being arty for arty's sake. She doesn't seem to want to play for elites. She doesn't want to seem to chase funding, you know, and be involved in projects that are obviously being only created because there's there's money behind it. All the things that are sort of um, messing up the contemporary jazz scene at the moment. Hiromi has been able to carve out a very successful career. If you've ever watched her on um, YouTube, every concert seems to be huge. You know, she's not playing jazz clubs as such. So at number nine, I have... Hiromi. Right. Who have I got at number eight? Well, um, this musician, I have been told by musicians that have worked with this person that this character is like the John Coltrane for the generation that has come up in the jazz scene over the last 30 years, right? Um, this musician has influenced, I think, the contemporary jazz scene so much and does not necessarily get the credit for this. 
This musician is the alto saxophone player Steve Coleman, who was the creative force behind the M bass movement in the 1980s that included people like Greg Osby and um, Cassandra Wilson, um, and to some extent people like Kevin Eubanks. He, he first emerged, uh, his, 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 Steve Coleman's dad was Chico Freeman, another great saxophone player. He comes from a line, line of, lineage of jazz. Um, he got the gig with Dave Holland in the late 70s, early 80s, I think, and the stuff he did with Dave Holland, if he'd have only done that, uh, his uh, greatness would be assured. Some of his playing and, and approach is absolutely groundbreaking. So how is he groundbreaking? It's, it's again like Hiromi for me, and it's for me what makes jazz so great when it is great today. It's the combining of the influences from jazz fusion with the influences from free jazz, modal jazz, and the, the, the post-bebop um, approach to jazz. Steve Coleman takes an almost sort of mystical, mathematical approach to music, but at the same time takes an approach which has really come from um, James Brown. His music could be seen almost like a, a, um, a fusion between Ornette Coleman, especially what Ornette was doing with Primetime, with James Brown and hip-hop approaches. Um, the way that he played on times, the way he uses numbers to create structures, um, he will um, have a, he has to approach to harmony where he will have a central point and you will move up mathematically and, and, and descend mathematically in sort of structures which you can move around which are, which are like sort of parallel or mirrored incredible approach to music. But when you listen to it, it doesn't sound like some technical prog metal math rock approach to music. There is a ton of heart. He's an incredible saxophone player, an incredible soloist, an absolute beacon, I think, for so many musicians who have emerged over the last few years. When we start to look at stuff which is going on now in the contemporary scene, um, and I would say this, this is personified by this sort of 16th note feel that is now... Um, it prevail in jazz and it, this may have become a cliche um, as musicians almost forget to swing nowadays. Um, whether the colleges are teaching swing and the blues I don't know but Steve Coleman is able to swing and access the blues. In fact um, the blues and specifically you know the African-American experience is absolutely ingrained into his approach musically uh, in a way that I find really compelling. Um, so that's who I have at number eight, is the creator of M Bass, and I think possibly in the last 30 years one of the great influences on contemporary jazz is Steve Coleman. At number seven I have Pat Metheny, who I think in terms of the post-jazz rock era the era brought in by the Mavishn Orchestra and Return to Forever and all, you know, Headhunters and all that sort of huge stuff that was in the 70s. Fusion, <coughs> which can be seen as the sort of um, um, ADH um, attention-seeking little brother of jazz, which is all the better for it as far as, as, far as I'm concerned, um, starts to stall after being possibly since swing, the most successful genre within jazz, so successful that the elite snobby jazz world had to deny that style. You know, this is why we have Adam Neely sort of saying that fusion isn't jazz, it's something else. This is ridiculous. To say that is to basically put a big wall in the history of jazz, which then turns that form into a dead form. Except fusion, or just turn jazz into a museum piece, right? That is what happened historically. Now, there are musicians that then took what the fusion guys had done and they moved it into the 1980s, which was pretty barren in terms of jazz, as jazz moved to sort of a, um, a conservative approach in the mainstream or an avant-garde approach, which no one was listening to. I'm thinking of bands like Ornette Combs, Prime Time, or Last Exit, all, the, all, the, all that type of stuff, which was oper operating right on the fringe. But one artist was able to pull all this together, take the, um, the, the, the approaches of traditional post-bebop jazz, take the innovations of Ornette Coleman, 
take um, what the fusion musicians had done and bowing that up into a style which is as once creatively extremely high but also extremely commercial. Our first listing for some of Pat Metheny's albums, they seem almost like um, Fusac, they seem very light and airy but they are light and airy in a way which is absolutely heavy as far as I'm concerned. These albums are masterpieces. Um, how do you do this? Well I think Part of it is, is that the great innovation of jazz rock, as I will now call it, actually goes back to a number of musicians that were operating before Miles came in and John McLaughlin came in and really defined what fusion was. And these are musicians like Larry Coriel and especially Gary Burton. Gary Burton is one of the few musicians to have successfully fused rock and, um, and um, jazz. He does it in a way that's different to the Mavish Doctrine and predates them. What Gary Burton does is he takes the innovations of songwriters like the Beatles, right? He takes their harmonic um, uh, innovations. You know, the Beatles would create beautiful uh, compositions by sticking in these weird chords every now and then. This is what someone like Rick Beato celebrates when songwriters do this. But what is not said is that the way the Beatles did that was not in the way that jazz musicians do that. Jazz musicians rely on cadences and they and they utilize the cadence to, ex, to expand out harmonically. But you can just drop any chord in. I can remember reading an interview with John McLaughlin and they said, what's your approach to one chord following the other? And he says, well, for me, I believe that you know any chord can follow any other chord. People didn't think like that. And so I have students that really feel that they have to be able to argue why one chord follows another. Um, I think Gary Burton was really innovative. Pat Metheny took that approach. And what that does, it gives the music a, a feeling of a songwriter. You know, so when you listen to Pat Metheny, you have partly all that Coleman going on, but you also have partly James Taylor, you know, which is evidence on the album off ramp with the track James, which is, um, you know, uh, a tribute to James Taylor. This approach is incredible, but also as well as having a career where he has done that, he has also been able to push into the extremes of jazz. You know, and uh, albums like Sign of Four, albums like Zero Tolerance of Silence, albums like Song X, even an album like Rejoicing, he is exploring ideas which the rest of the jazz world decided to drop, to turn away from, as the jazz education system moved towards a place where to be a jazz musician you have to be able to play the changes. Now Pat Metheny has said this himself, he feels that um, composition is, is more interesting when people play the changes and that will be used against me when I state this. But so often when you study what Pat Metheny is doing, his improvisation is far more interesting than that and he's far more versed in the world that Ornette Coleman produced. You know, if you want to know about that, go and look at my discussion of Ornette Coleman on my 10 greatest jazz musicians of all time. When you hear Pat Metheny's approach to Giant Steps on his trio album, he is approaching that in a way that's absolutely unique, that pulls into improvisational approaches which have, have, have come in in the 60s and the 1970s. He's been able to draw that through. This is really, really important. And I think other musicians have done it as well. I think Schofield's done it to a certain extent. And John Schofield's hovering. He should have been on this list and he's not. But Pat Metheny is and he represents that. God, I'm taking some time on this video. Up to 20 minutes and I'm up to number seven. So who have I got at number six? You guys aren't going to believe this. I've rated this guy higher than Pat Metheny, Steve Coleman, Hiromi and Roy Haynes. Um, if you watch this channel, you'll be surprised and I am really happy to be able to sing this guy's praises because he's one of the greatest musicians of the last 40 years, undoubtedly. And that is, of course, the incredible Wynton Marsalis. Right, um, I first came across Wynton Marsalis in 1982 when the BBC did a documentary. I watched this documentary and on this was a very young musician who seemed adept at playing post-bebop, you know, time no changes type of jazz with an incredible band that was full of superstars Kenny Kirkland, Jeff Tain Watts, all these incredible musicians. Um, he came from a family that seemed to be an absolute virtuosos with musicians like Branford Marsalis also doing incredible stuff and Jason on drums, Jason Marsalis who's been a guest on this channel doing incredible music. Um, if we take aside what he was represented in the 1980s that I have been critical of, Winton's actual musical output has been pretty incredible. Um, his, I think he probably emerges musically for me with the um, VSF 
VSOP albums where he'd take home from Freddie Hubbard playing with the cl classic Miles Davis quintet of Herbie Hancock, you know, Ron Carter, Tony Williams, um, uh, Wayne Shorter. And uh, his playing on that stuff is, is unbelievable and he doesn't get mentioned. You want to check out the Herbie um, Winter Marsalis stuff in the early days. Um, as Jason Marsalis pointed out to me, Winter Marsalis emerges at a time when a lot of the future guys were moving over to a much more conservative straight ahead style. VSOP being an example of that. And Herbie Hancock really champions um, Winter Marsalis at this time. Um, appearing on his debut album. I bought the debut album when it came out and it floored me because what it contained was all my heroes, Tony Williams, Herbie Hancock, you know, Ron Carter, all these incredible musicians playing exploratory jazz. And to give Winston his due, when he emerges then with his own band and, and Bradford at the same time, he, I, I was a big fan of Bradford albums in the, in the 1980s as well. They are exploring free jazz approaches in a way that people hadn't done before. There was a there was a muscular, um, a muscular and a direct way of utilizing those techniques that I found very very um, rewarding. Um, I've explained on this channel that I think, you know, Winton at a very young age became the poster boy for a sort of um, neoconservatism in jazz, you know, um, mentored by people like um, Stanley Crouch. And um, I grew up in an era playing jazz where this was the big thing that was going on in the 1980s as I was learning jazz. And I was a big Fusion fan. And I got very upset that musicians that I loved were getting hammered by the press that had no support and were almost living on the breadline because of this thing that had come into jazz. Um, I also felt that it, it was divisive in that it, it, it was really trying to argue for sort of jazz as a black classical music. And it was receiving funding based upon that, um, which I didn't think was fair. Not because it doesn't benefit me or I'm arguing from a white point of view, but specifically because you also had absolutely, in my mind, innovative musicians like, say, for example, Alan Holdsworth or Sean Lane that were operating right at the fringes of music. And, and, and I just found this very divisive. Um, as time has gone on, I've obviously back then, Winston was in his 20s. He's now in his 60s. And... Um, talking about Winton from that sort of 1980s perspective and then being contacted by his brother Jason and talking to Jason and then starting to listen to what Winton is saying now. I have to admit, and this is what this channel's about, I have to admit that the, the person that now has the closest view of jazz and jazz history to me is Winton Masalis. He sees it, I think, as a great American tradition in which you know, um, black musicians have played an incredible part, the, uh, and, and creatively, without a doubt, black musicians have played the most creative part of this. But it is not a black music form. And I think Winton, if he was here, and I would love to have the conversation with him, because I come from a point of view, and I think Winton does, because um, Winton, more recently, has um, come under the brilliant... Um, philosophical approach to jazz and American culture of the great Albert Murray, who came, turned this um, term omni-American. And I will do this, this, this idea of being an omni-American is an incredible thing because I think it's what jazz embodies. If this is the case, and this is where Winton is coming from now, I believe that he's overall, you know, apart from the fact he's one of the great trumpet virtuosos of all time, he's in the top five greatest, he's up there with Dizzy, he's up there with Freddie Hubbard. His, his, his influence in jazz is obviously unquestionable, but I think where he's going to culturally is absolutely fascinating, and I want to see how this develops. So, Winton, if you are watching this, all strength to you. I think what you're doing is absolutely fantastic. I'm really, I'm actually getting my hair standing up on the back of my neck at the thought that you might be watching this and to be able to say, I think your contribution to the last 40 years of music has placed you 
at number six behind, you know, five musicians, which I think you will, will say are, are very good musicians. And that I think your input into this incredible art form has not finished. And um, I think um, you could still well save Jazz Winton. Please save it for us all who love it so much, Winton. You can still do it, you know. So that's my uh, little message to Winton Marsalis. You know, through all of this, I, 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 I have felt slightly guilty of having a ton of Winter Masalis albums behind me and a ton of Bradford Masalis albums and absolutely loving his playing and what he's done musically in the world of jazz. The Black Codes album is one of the greatest jazz albums of the last 40 years, without a doubt. So I hope I have been able to crawl back a little bit there <laughs> in terms of my journey in um, discussing the cultural nature of jazz and how it affects some little white class, white class, <laughs> white middle class, you know, rock musician sat here in, you know, in the West Midlands in Birmingham that whose whole life has been completely changed by the um, incredible artistic output of these incredible jazz musicians, which I feel are the greatest artists of the last hundred or so years. That is where I'm coming from. I think we're all coming from that. And uh, the next one on the list, above Winton, is one of those musicians. Um, and it's someone that doesn't get the credit. And they're still around and they're very, very old. And we should be treasuring this person. At number five, I have... And I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to have to check that this guy's still alive because I feel that they might not be. Let's just... Let's just um, if not, I have really made an error because as I'm looking at this, I made this list. Right, he, this next guy's dead. I've made a mistake on this video. Winton, if you're sorry, if you're watching, I am really sorry. So, um, this has cocked it up. How did I go wrong? I've put someone on the list that is dead. I'm not going to tell you who it is. You can try and guess, but I ain't going to tell you. Right, so um, this has messed up my list. So it, it, this is now the top nine. <laughs> the nine greatest. That's the only way I can cover this mistake that I've made here. What an idiot. It, as I looked at it, I thought this person's dead. He's dead. So um, what I'm going to do, right, because I've just talked about him and I think he deserves to go on this list. I'm going to put, I'm going to put the whole Marsalis family up. Jason, Bradford and Winton, you're all up. But I'm not going to let you take up three spaces. I'm going to let you take up two. Is that a fair deal? Because um, you're still alive. You've managed to all get on. Bradford, if you're watching as well, you've just got on the list because the guy that I was about to talk about is dead. I cannot believe this. Right. <laughs> So, uh, 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 so this, this at uh, number six and number five, we have um, the Marsalis family. Um, especially Winton and Bradford. And you, Jason, you're in there. But uh, Bradford is one of my favourite musicians, a huge influence on me over the last 40 years. And a guy that has done more for fusion than many musicians in that period as he talks trying to cover his huge mistake but at least you see the mistakes on here at least you see the way this went i cannot believe i put that guy down <sighs> so we're at number four now aren't we so at number four i have herbie hancock <laughs> you know herbie hancock how old's herbie hancock is in his 80s doesn't see me you look at him he appears he looks like he's about 42 doesn't he um, it's all the Buddhism. Herbie Hancock's influence on the last 60 years of music is unfathomable. He is a giant. Right? Um, from his work in Miles Davis's band, the, the great quintet, as I've mentioned, but also his own albums. As soon as he starts making albums in the 60s, he is making masterpieces. Maiden Voyage. Imperial they're masterpieces. Speak like a child, masterpiece. One masterpiece after another. Um, without doubt, the, the albums he just made in the 60s could easily make a list of the in, in the 20 greatest jazz albums ever made. Right? So there are two huge feats. 
And as soon as the jazz rock thing starts to happen, he starts to, start to explore it, but he explored it from a different angle. He's bringing in the funk. The great innovation originally of jazz rock was the rock. But he brings on the, in the funk and by an album like Fat Albert Rotunda, which I absolutely love, which came out in 1969, which never gets mentioned, he has forged a way of playing fusion. Um, he then takes the innovations of Miles Davis, you know, the inner silent way British brew, which he's involved with, right? And he takes that into the Marandishi band. Again, one of the greatest jazz groups of all time, pioneering a way of playing um, a fusion, which is unparalleled. Then he decides to go commercial and he forms Headhunters. Headhunters, again, is one of the greatest jazz groups of all time. Absolutely mind-blowing. Then he decides to become a pop musician and he has hit records, things like Hang Up Your Hang Ups. And eventually he makes a record with Bill Laswell called Rocket. And Rocket is groundbreaking, laying the ground to the sound of 80s pop music. But he doesn't stop there. He creates album like a new standard where he takes... Um, um, contemporary popular music and he plays it in a jazz standard way opening the doors to all these awful albums made by people like Rob, Robbie you know Robbie Williams and um, Ron Stewart and Brian Ferry where they could go back and, and, and mine this history in a contemporary way but also making the point that um, these are the modern jazz standards um, he has worked on albums with you know where he has played Joni Mitchell songs and dealt with songwriting he has done session work for, on from everybody to pop he even crops up playing piano on a last exit album playing the most out there free jazz alongside Sonny Sharrick and um uh Peter Broatsman the late great Peter Broatsman Herbie Hancock is a monster he is a giant he's one of the greatest of all time that's who I've done before um, at number three, and these th these two musicians here should be together. They're they're not they're no when greater than each other. But at number three, I have Keith Jarrett. <sighs> Keith Jarrett's another giant. Um, he's forged his own path through music. Again, he has been able to take innovations from post bebop, from free jazz from jazz fusion, from jazz rock, and from folk music, singer-songwriter stuff. Um, I'm going to have a great problem on this video trying to explain why Keith Jarrett's so great. Um, I have got a video where I explore Keith Jarrett. It's about an hour long, and it was that was not enough to really explain this guy's greatness. Um, so I'm going to try and hear to, to come at it from a different angle. Well, I don't know what the angle is at the moment, but I think I want to try and succinctly explain why Keith Jarrett's so high on the list and why he's so important to the history of jazz. Um, when, when Ken Burns made that jazz documentary, he admitted a whole bunch of artists. One of the artists he admitted was Keith Jarrett. Keith Jarrett had released an album on ECM called The Colin Concert. And this album had sold millions and millions. It is the biggest selling solo piano um, album of all time. Millions and millions. This album is a recording of an, of an improvisation which Keith Jarrett sat at the piano and played. Keith Jarrett is a great innovator in this approach to creating albums. You know, one person with their instrument, with no material, improvising a piece of music which is so great and touches so many people that it sells millions and millions and goes outside the confines of jazz to a wider audience. He does this without any compromise to commerciality, in fact the opposite, with a total commitment to his own vision. Um, this is partly due to the huge influence that jazz rock and fusion had on him. Before he made that album, he had spent some time playing electric piano and organ in Miles Davis's group, uh, for me contributing one of the great voices of electric jazz. Uh, a style of music which he has criticised. Right, He has stuck to his guns and he has made acoustic music. But he is a fusion musician, right? 
the smell of acousticness um, elevates his music in, in, in the eyes of the critics to being higher because it's acoustic. That is definitely a snobbery that existed in the 70s. But there is a sort of gospel soul influence in his music, which is most evidenced by, I think, his second solo album, which is not a jazz album. It's a singer-songwriter album where he sings and plays guitar in the style of sort of an American folk singer. Check it out. He plays electric bass. And you will find as well, in the 80s, he re released an album of electric guitar solos, which is absolutely wonderful, made in his own studio by recording a drum part, which he played, transferring this then through overdubbing to a bass part and then overdubbing um, really interesting guitar solos, although not a virtuoso guitar solos, solos that really evidence his ability to organise improvisation, which is his great strength. I talked about Hiromi being connected. Watch him perform. He's connected. He's connected to that instrument. This is someone who was born in love with the piano. He would sit under the piano from the eight year dot, you know, just touching it and feeling that they have, has, a, has um, a relationship to that instrument which is absolutely profound, which exists to this day. If you watch the recent Rick Beato uh, interview with Keith, which is absolutely astonishing. And even though he is now at the age of 78, um, unable to play with his right hand, I think, only able to play with his left, it was just one of the great musical events of the last year to hear Keith Jarrett play again and to hear him play with his left hand where all that is left now is his great ability to structure improvisation by connecting to the great res reservoir of the infinite to such an extent that he was able to make an album that sold a million copies and took jazz out to the whole world which was then ignored by the Ken Burns documentary. That went well. <laughs> so we've got number two. This is going to be a shock. People aren't going to like it, but they also anyone who watches my channel will know why this guy's there, and I'm going to argue it now. At number two, I have my lord and master, John McLaughlin. John McLaughlin. John McLaughlin. John McLaughlin. John McLaughlin. So I've done all the pronunciations and from now on I'm just going to call him John like he's not John, John, like he's my mate. He's not my mate, you know, I wish he was. I wish John McLaughlin was my mate because I absolutely love him. This is the one musician that changed my life. Um, when I was growing up, I was searching for something. When I first went searching, I thought it would be the bands like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, but it wasn't. There was something there but he wasn't there. There was something, it was pointing to something. What was it pointing? Maybe ELP or Led Zeppelin or Deep Purple. And I checked those bands out. But he wasn't there. But there was something more there. I kept following this. I kept following it and following it and reading and studying it and trying to get something. And this guy kept cropping up. When I was, the, whatever I was searching for, Gurdjieff calls this the magnetic center. I had a magnetic center towards something that had, is, is, it the, is it the root of why I do this channel? And I think I just mentioned it about Keith Sharrett. I think we'll get on to this. This is my approach to talking about John McLaughlin, who is somebody I've talked about more than any other musician on this channel. So what am I going to say? I went searching for something. And um, when my mum found a copy of Birds of Fire, which I'd been searching for for about a year, and wasn't able to track a copy down, and I put it on, the weight of expectation meant that this album should have been a letdown to me, but it wasn't. I found what I was looking for. Um, when I, through my magnetic centre, made contact with Narada Michael Walden, right? And, and my contact with, with Narada is through the fact that I, I'm sending back the love that I felt I heard on that album. Love is a part of it. I uh, was reading an interview with John this morning and uh, it was a great interview we did with Robert Fripp and he said something that uh, and he, he said something that I have come to the same conclusion I didn't realize he had said this that music is made out of love but when I made contact with Narada and spoke to him he talked about 
John's interest in the infinite and the infinite being God. It's God being the name for the thing that we cannot understand. Now I am religiously agnostic but for me what John McLaughlin does goes beyond belief or unbelief. It makes that unimportant and talking to Narda I had the same feeling and it changed my approach and thoughts of the universe around me. John has done that since I first heard him when I was 15 years old. Now I can also argue that the architect of fusion, jazz rock, is John McLaughlin. He's the one who solves it. Everyone's trying to do it. Miles is trying to do it. Don Ellis is trying to do it. Gary Burton's trying to do it. Larry Coryell's trying to do it. They're all trying to do it in the late 60s, early 70s. The guy that comes on and shows how to do it is John. Now, why does John, why does that work? It's because that band he had had somebody from every single continent, right? Almost every single continent. He drew together this multicultural, you know, people from England, people from America, people from Panama, people from New Zealand. He pulled all this together, right, into this, this great, you know, multicultural band. And then he opened his arms, not just to jazz and rock, but to absolutely everything, country music, Indian music, African music, all this stuff is channeled into the Mavish Orchestra. It is true fusion, creating a style of music that then becomes, like Keith Jarrett, massively successful, but also artistic, incredibly valid. Right, to such an extent that it busts out of the genre. Keith Jarrett and John are both bust out of the genre, which to the conservative elitist is the worst thing you can possibly do, right? Um, his career is unparalleled in jazz. He is at number two. So it leaves now the great position of who the greatest living jazz musician is for me to end with. And it's a musician I haven't spoken about on this channel. And they are truly one of the greatest musicians of the 20th century and could have easily got on my greatest list. And it is, of course, who a guy that is um, 93 years old and, like Roy Haynes, connects us with the great jazz, jazz tradition. But in his case, he is a leader of that tradition at a number of points. And that is, of course, you all know who it is. Who is it? Of course, Sonny Rollins. Sonny Rollins. Could, we could well argue that Sonny Rollins... In terms of improvisation, you know what I was going to say about Keith Jarrett? Sonny Rollins is a, is a true improviser. All right? This guy can play anything. He's come out of bebop. He has incredible technique. has incredible tone. He has um, a fluency on the saxophone and um, an at-oneness with that instrument, which is unparalleled. He has a vision for that instrument. But the thing that's interesting about uh, Sonny Rollins is there's no compromise whatsoever. So we get this famous jazz story. It's a historic jazz story. It's equal to the story of Charlie Parker having the cymbal chucked at him by uh, Joe Jones. And that is at one point he really wanted to go deep into um, improvisation fundamentally. So he spent night after night walking out to some bridge in New York, I think, and sits, standing on that and playing his saxophone into the wind. He then comes out with an, another approach, even though with albums like Way Out West and Saxophone Colossus, he had already created some of the greatest albums in the history of jazz. He then follows that up with an album called The Bridge, which is, is my favourite Sonny Rollins album. This guy is connected. It's why I've talked about all the way through this. He is, he is possibly the greatest improviser of the last 70 years. I'm trying to think of someone greater. Miles Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, Wes Montgomery, maybe. Keith Jarrett. But Sonny Rollins rates above all these for me. Um, I'm going to go back to the Ken Burns documentary. There's an incredible story about Sonny Rollins where some guy has gone to see Sonny Rollins playing and he's involved in this um, great big saxophone solo. It's Easter weekend. 
It's the Saturday of Easter weekend. They've had Good Friday, it's a Saturday. And that's that night, Saturday night, he's playing and he's involved in some long solo, which he seems completely absorbed in. And suddenly he plays in this long stream of consciousness stuff a phrase, and that phrase is and that is the that comes from the tune Easter Bonnet. Put on your Easter bonnet. Now, why would you put on your Easter bonnet for? You would put on your Easter bonnet because it's Easter Sunday. As he noticed it, he looked at his watch and his watch was striking midnight. It had just become Easter Sunday and Sonny Rollins was able, within <laughs> this world that he was inhabiting, to pass a comment like that about the situation that he's in. Right, um, I've tried to improvise all my life. I've practiced and I'm okay, I can improvise. That's, I see myself as an improvising musician. When I hear about people talking about improvisation, I understand where they're coming from. This idea of trying to connect and the great reservoir and the infinite and all this stuff I've talked through, which is the underlying, you know, um, esoteric part of this video there, I've told you it. That's really what I'm talking about here. Um, I, it is unfathomable to me of where that comes from. Where does something like that comes from? It reminds me of a story about Krishnamurti. Krishnamurti was having a conversation with someone and he was in a deep conversation about it. And at one point he starts to reference the fact that in the corner of a room a great event had happened in that a petal had dropped off a flower, right? This also relates to what um, Alistair Crowley um, described as magic. Magic, he said, was the ability to tune into what is going on around you so you know what is about to happen. It's, it's extreme mindfulness. And surely improvisation is extreme mindfulness and when we listen to Sonny Rollins we perhaps have an example of that at the highest level that humanity can produce it is the great evidence the actual proof of the existence of the infinite within the Western world. That is what I think. Um, it is the 8th of November. I'm, well, I've got my computer here. Um, I wasn't going to do this. I'm, 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 I'm struggling through this because my wife's brother Grant uh, died last night. Um, I'm going to because I've been talking about the infinite and the stuff I've been talking about, and I think that's what's informed this talk, you know, is I am going to, um, you know, memorialise this video um, as a tribute to um, my brother-in-law Grant, who was a fantastic musician and singer, so who died last night, far too young. Um, Grant, I hope you can get this message. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Okay. Rest in peace, Grant. Um, let us all believe in the infinite because it exists.